Welcome back everybody. Another exciting video here at Blue Glow Electronics today. Um, this one's going to be titled A Practical Guide to Tube Testing um, and or slash tube testers. Um, I've had some comments lately on some of my posts and one of them uh, online, one or two of them was around tube testers and you know it kind of sparked me to say hey why don't I do one on tube testers. A um, couple things I want to talk about as we go through this. One is what's the difference between a good tube tester and a mediocre tube tester and a not so good tube tester. And you know how do most of the good tube testers operate per se. And um, you know what is it about them that makes them a good tube tester. And um, a little bit about what do the values you get when you're doing the testing, what do they mean and, uh, and what not. And then we're actually going to dive in and do some tube testing. Um, I've got two tube testers here in front of me, um, and I'll do some testing on both of them. Um, I probably got a dozen different tube testers around the house here, mainly because I pick them up at various uh, flea markets, uh, ham fest, yard sales, uh, estate sales, whatever, and uh, and I kind of stash them away because one they're not making any more of them so some of these things have continued to climb in value and got quite pricey too every once in a while I'll get somebody over here that says hey I really need a good tube tester and we'll go find one down in the barn and uh, I'll pull it out and I'll say well I'll clean this one up for you and calibrate it and, uh, and it can be yours <laughs> for a nominal fee so, uh, so that's why I, I kind of hoard them up as I find them but I will tell you I have owned a multitude of testers over the years of different types, different shapes, different values. Um, I've, I've owned two testers that I paid uh, fifty dollars for that I use all the time, and I've got two testers that I paid three thousand dollars for that I use very seldom. So uh, we'll maybe talk a little bit about the differences between those as well today. Um, you can see here, I just got a couple tubes here that I grabbed. Um, one's a, a new 6L6 or 5881 here uh, that I knew was new. Um, this was an old, had a no idea what shape it is, still don't. 6L6 in a uh, metal case. And I got an old uh, Mullard 12AX7 that I recently found in a tube lot. Um, that should be a pretty good one if it tests out okay. And I've got some uh, some RCA receiving tube manuals here. I'll talk a little bit about those as well. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about the different types of tube testers that are out there. Um, first and foremost, um, my favorite tube tester on this earth, and I've owned lots of the good ones, I continue to come back to this thing. It is uh, it's a military issue uh, TV7D uh, slash U tube tester and uh, these were actually made by several different people for the military um, one of which was actually Hickok made a lot of these it was based kind of on a Hickok design um, another company was Stark out of um, uh, Canada and mine was actually as you can see here made by this company uh, Polartron in Long Beach uh, New Jersey they basically um, sent out the specs for these things to various uh, manufacturing facilities uh, as long as they built them to spec and got the parts from the right places um, and, and you know basically made them so they all came out the same regardless of what factory um, the military commissioned these things out to different places and uh, I haven't found a real difference between ones made in the various locations they all seem to be about the same as it comes to the TV7 um, they also made this in a TV7A um, a B and a C and I will tell you that the A, B and C when it comes to usability are pretty much the same as this D unit. The D unit seem to command a premium um, and it's mainly because they have one more range over here on their uh, function switch that really tests real high um, U tubes and uh, it's something you don't run into very often so most people would be fine with an uh, A, B, or C model. Now, um, the fact that I um, also service and calibrate tube testers, there is a difference uh, when it comes to owning one of these if you're going to calibrate it and service it yourself. 
Um, the DU on the inside um, actually has some some variable potentiometers that you adjust when you're doing the, um, the calibration, whereas some of the other models earlier, A, B, and C, they use fixed resistors in there. So instead of having these potentiometers, you actually had to kind of swap out resistors, uh, these little round resistors, um, to get the right values, to get the right settings to do the calibration. So I will say this is the easiest to calibrate. Since you may or may not be doing that yourself, um, and you may be paying someone to do that, um, they'll likely charge you more to calibrate one of the others because it will take them longer. But um, but nonetheless, there are um, the, the ABC are all great units, and I wouldn't hesitate to own one for one second. Um, this tube tester um, is an ICO 667. Um, it's actually the very first tube tester I ever owned, and I've had this thing for 30 plus years. As you can see, it's, uh, it's you know it's got a nice little uh, folding metal case here that when it's not in use, it folds up really nice. Um, and I'll try to show you that at the end. I'll put both these up maybe and put them down here on the shelf where they're normally at, and you can see. Similarly with this one, you know, it's got a nice uh, folding lid that kind of folds over and locks on this thing when you get done. But um, the 667 is a great tube tester. Let me tell you why. Um, you remember I talked earlier about great tube testers, pretty good tube testers, and the not so good tube testers. This falls into the pretty good tube testers range. You can obtain one of these um, in nice shape, fully working, that's been cleaned, serviced, calibrated, probably in the $250 to $300 range. Um, and honestly, it would be all that anyone ever needed for the most part. Uh, and I'll talk about that most part here in a minute. Um, one of these units in this shape that this one's in, I mean, this thing is uh, nearly mint. Um, you could be looking at eleven, twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 for a, one of these. And I remember it wasn't 10 or 15 years ago, and you could have picked this up for the two or $300. So some of the good ones just keep going up higher and higher in value. But what the 667 does that the um, TV7 cannot do, the reason I keep two, two tube testers here on the bench, is it can test what I call compactron tubes. So um, a compactron tube, if you'll notice the uh, pin outs on it, mm -hmm. um, these things have a bunch of pins here, and they typically have a plate cap on the top here um, where you pull the uh, plate connection. And these, uh, and you can you can see here, this is a Philco 6JS6 tube. These were used in TVs um, to drive the uh, horizontal and vertical sweep in the tubes, and that's they have a nickname called sweep tubes. Um, and um, more recently, these got gobbled up in the 80s by and 90s by the. Uh, by the CBers and were used in a lot of illegal amplifiers that um, that are still being in use all around the world uh, for uh, uh, CB amplifiers. So um, typically, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm a tube collector slash hoarder myself. I've been uh, collecting, hunting, digging, finding tubes for nearly 30, 35 years now, ever since I was a little boy. Um, fascinated by them, not sure why. But um, and I collect audio tubes, and when I find tubes like these that, uh, that I have no use for, I typically test them, mark them up well, put them on eBay, and sell them if they, if they test out well. But, but this device is capable of testing compactrons, and uh, this is an older tube tester, probably built around uh, 62 or so, 63, um, maybe, maybe a little later. It does not test compactrons. If you'll notice, there are no sockets on here with uh, with this number of pins on it, uh, unlike um, what you do see over here. Um, there is a downside to a tube tester that can test compactrons. One of the things you will find is they're typically designed to test newer tubes. So you'll have the uh, newer compactron tube set. You'll have your 8-pin octal, typically. You'll have your 9-pin um, um, tube socket here, but what you may not have, um, and you'll have your um, smaller tube socket here, but what you may not have that you'll start to see over here is the older 4-pin, um, the older 5-pin tube sockets and whatnot. So 
There are types of tubes that I could only test on this tester. So, example, a good old audio tube like a 2A3 or a 45 um, or 300B that is a four pin tube set. Um, could only test over here. Couldn't test it on this one. But hey, if you're uh, you know, doing something with compactrons or whatnot, uh, could test them here, could not test them here. Um, I will tell you in the six, in the ICO 667 uh, in this ICO line, there's also one called an ICO 666. The 666, interestingly, does not test compactrons, and it has up here at the top. It has the four pin, five pin um, tube socket. So could get by owning a 666 and a 667 and be able to test everything in the world. Um, I've literally um, not found too many tube testers, maybe just maybe one or two out there that will test them all. Um, yeah, typically you end up in this dual scenario. And if you're an audio guy like me, um, you probably aren't going to be messing around with compactrons a lot. So you could probably get by with one tube tester like this. Um, the, the, like I say, the beauty of having the compactron is, let's just say you go to, you look on Craigslist or you go to a yard sale and you find a, uh, you know, an old uh, TV repairman tube bin full of tubes and you buy it up and you get it home and uh, you sort through it and you pull out all the good audio tubes that you want. And you're like, woohoo, and then you find a bunch of these new old stock in boxes and you're like, wow, well, I could sell those if I could test them um, and make my money back for what I paid for the other stuff. Well got to have a way to test them, so you'll need something with a Compactron tube tester. Um, coming back around, though, I mentioned earlier, uh, I forgot to close off that part of my sentence, was a really good tube tester, okay tube tester, and uh, not so great. I kind of tagged this one in the middle, and the reason I've done that is um, this thing is capable of doing what they call here dynamic conductance. Um, another fancy word for mutual transconductance, um, otherwise known as GM, um, the abbreviation, in testing tubes. So what you actually are getting into um, is measurements of how the tube's emissions are. Not just does the tube filament light up um, and heat the tube up, not just does the tube conduct and actually uh, you know, work, but actually how much um, emissions does the tube uh, you know produce um, given a set of parameters or whatnot so these this one does a pretty good job of uh, giving you a relative value of um, you know how, how the emissions are on a tube and why that's important is um, like let's just give you an example let's say you're an audio guy and you had uh, two of these and they were going to be the in the uh, push-pull part of an amplifier um, well, you want these things matched. Um, if you'll remember, let me take a, make a note real quick. You know, I love my 20 second, or my, excuse me, two second, 20 millisecond drawing here. I literally just sketched this. Um, but if you'll remember in an um, amplifier where you're on a push-pull configuration, much like most guitar amplifiers, a lot of stereo amplifiers, you've got two matched tubes in the output. And if you'll remember, you're using a... Uh, a phase splitter of some sort up front in the tube stages that basically splits the uh, the top part of this signal from the bottom part of this signal and sends them kind of down two different paths inside of the amplifier. Um, and then you know one, the top part would end up going into a tube like this, and it would get amplified. And then you know you would send the bottom part of this signal um, through another tube like this, and you would get it amplified here. So let's just pretend here that uh, these two tubes were not um, matched and you had um, kind of, you know, transconductance value of, let's just say, um, you know, coming off of this tube tester, um, a relative value. Let's just say it gave us a value up here when we tested on one of them at, let's just say, 82, which is in the good range, and another one was at 100. Um, well, you may end up producing a signal something like this coming out, whereas one part of you, you know, that's feeding through one of the tubes is getting amplified a whole lot more than the, uh, the part going through the other tube that had a lower uh, GM value. Or likewise, you know, the, uh, the upper part could be amplified much less than the bottom part. 
which would ultimately be bad. Um, it would not sound very good. Um, not a, you know, not having a good match set of tubes will end up with a, a difference in gain, which the difference in gain, which is kind of what this GM um, indicates from an emissions standpoint, and a difference in gain here would end up with a uh, less than perfect waveform, even though the signal you're feeding it could be a perfect sine wave. So a lot of people want match tubes, and uh, match tubes come in a couple different varieties of, uh, of ways. Um, but the goal of a match tube would be the amplitude you measure from here to here and here to here would be identical, and it would be symmetrical, unlike my, uh, my quick drawing here. That's why I don't draw for a living. Um, but anyway, it could be two tubes sitting side by side here that you're wanting to match to each other. This tube tester will do a good enough job of giving you a relative value of emissions um, to let you know that, hey, one was an 82, and I tested a bunch of others, and I found another one that tested an 82. So I put these two 82s right side by side, and I can now call that somewhat a matched pair. Um, I'm generalizing an awful lot here, <laughs> guys and gals, without getting too technically deep. But that's the gist of it. Um, I will tell you that when you actually put a tube like this in an actual circuit um, with actual voltages and actual bias and whatnot and configurations, um, you may end up with slightly different values than this tube tester tells you. Um, and that's kind of the difference between a really good tube tester and uh, when I had this one here in the mediocre tube tester range. Um, so. Um, the better the tube tester, the more like a true circuit the tube tester actually simulates, the more likely when you get this into an amplifier it will behave the way that the tube tester tested it. So um, this tube tester, along with some other higher-end ones, so um, some of them I can think of, um, like the Hickok 539B or C, uh, the 752 Hickok, um, you know, do a pretty good job of getting pretty darn close to real circuit um, type uh, voltages. I'll give an example. Um, you, you step down into this range and some of the voltages that it's applying to this tube, like you know, the plate voltage um, that it's testing it at, um, might be a little less than what it would be used in an actual circuit. So it's good at giving relative values, I would say not good at giving scientific values, but you know, for what most people are doing, um, you know, just trying to find out if a tube's good or not, trying to find out if it's, uh, you know, how the gain is on it, and compare that gain to another tube, so you can get two just about alike, get them put into your uh, piece of musical equipment and use it. Um, it's, it's a great tube tester. That's the reason it's on my bench, that's the reason I use it. Um, you get into this one and some higher end ones, um, gets much more precise at applying uh, real live circuit voltages um, and uh, more real world type scenarios. So, we've talked a little bit now about the tubes, we've talked about balancing and matching and whatnot. Um, one other thing I will mention so, 12AX7, uh, a lot of people look at these things and they're like, wow, um, you know, I read all the time about, you know, getting a matched pair of tubes. But then I read about getting a match tube. Well, why would this tube, why would you buy a match 12AX7 but not a match 6L6? Um, well, here's why. This 6L6 really has one active um, set of elements in it, one active component. is a single tube inside of a single piece of glass. Um, this tube, the 12AX7 here, is not. Um, if you can see, there are two sets of plates. There are two filaments, there are two grids, there are two screens. Um, there's two sets of active elements inside of this tube. So in essence, you have two tubes inside of one. Um, and what, so in a guitar amplifier, for example, or maybe a stereo amplifier, the front end you're picking up off of a phono stage or a, uh, you know, auxiliary port or coming out of the FM tuner, you got to take that little bitty weak signal and you kind of got to amplify it and get it up to what I would call line level. Um, to be fed into uh, you know, the power output section. Well, they do that an awful lot with tubes that have two, two sets of uh, components inside of them. So this could be the front end of an amplifier where maybe on the back end you have 
you know, a matched pair of these um, amplifying the uh, one side of the stereo signal. Um, you may have another matched pair over here for the other side. So you very well could have, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, both channels feeding into one of these into four output tubes per se, uh, which is not a very uncommon uh, scenario. So think of this as two tubes inside of one. So when you go to test one of these, you'll see here in a little bit, you actually have to test both sides of this thing. Uh, and the closer these are matched, uh, back to this scenario, um, the better off you are. Think about in the beginning of an audio amplifier, if you're taking this teeny little signal coming off of, let's just say, a phono cartridge head, and you're trying to amplify it up once or twice in order to get it up to a level you can feed into the power amplifier, if this is what you got going on early on when you're dealing with a teeny little circuit, um, or teeny little bit of amplitude in the circuit, um, by the time it makes it through, and if this isn't balanced, by the time it makes it to the power output section, let's say these are balanced perfectly, and this one's not, let's say one side's producing, you know, 40% more gain than the other side, and you've still got something like this going on, by the time it gets to this part, it, it doesn't know any better. This part will amplify one side 40% more than the other part. Um, so, you know, then this may be multiplying that another you know, 10 times or something. So you're then talking a 400, um, a, you know, a 400 um, order of magnitude different between uh, what you saw on the very front end and the output of this thing. So, uh, you know, I'm doing some pretty gross exaggerations here, but needless to say, uh, the front end circuits of uh, amplifiers are very important and they're very uh, sensitive. So uh, any variations there, just kind of get amplified along the way as we get into it. Um, I want to show you one or two other things here. This is a uh, an old RCA receiving tube manual and if you'll notice there's something here on it that says RC30. It's just telling you the version of this book. Over time this book has been updated and updated and updated um, and RC30 is the latest version of this. So if you happen to find one, snag it. Um, they're great books. I bought out a lot of tubes here recently from an old uh, repair shop here in Winston-Salem. And uh, I was digging through it, and lo and behold, and, and there was a RC30. And I'd, I was just about as excited about finding another RC30 book as I was on uh, some, some of the really valuable tubes that were inside the lot. Um, pretty, neat, pretty neat story behind that one. Um, you know, I've, I've bought out two blots, anywhere from 10 tubes to... Uh, I've, I bought one here this summer that had 40,000 tubes in it. Um, took me months to go through those, by the way. Um, so if I'm not making videos and I'm not at my day job, um, and I'm not playing or doing something with my kids, um, you guess what I'm doing. I'm sorting and uh, testing tubes a lot of times. But um, you know, I found another RC30. I was really excited. Um, so get you one of these. Uh, it is the de facto standard manual for all tubes and uh, tells you everything you want to know. I'll show you here more in a second. This is a uh, manual that somebody on the internet has uh, basically copied the RC30 manual. It's a really nice looking book here. Um, you know, really clean white pages, brand new book basically. Sorry I had to pause. My son came home and the dogs were going crazy. but. Um, Anyway, this book, uh, really nice book, so if you can't find an original, get one of these. But what I will tell you is that these um, these have been photocopied. So somebody basically took one of these apart, page by page, um, somehow made a new book out of it. <laughs> but you can tell that, that when you start to try to read the crispness of some of the letters, they're not as crisp as the original. But uh, if you can't find one, these are like 30, 40 bucks, something like that, new online, just get you one. Um, it'll make do until maybe one day you can uh, find out one of these. But let's look inside of it here. I had it page apart here, but it'll tell you here that the you know the 6L6 or the 6L6 GC. Um, it'll tell you a little bit about it, what it's for, you know, what they were typically used for, audio amplifying equipment. Tell you the 6L6 GC can be used in type place of the 6L6. Da 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 da. But then what it gets into is all the technical voltage um, voltage configuration. It'll give you a pin out of it. So if you want to know which pins are the, uh, 
you know, like here, two and seven, you can see, or the heater. Um, you can see three here is the plate. You've got grid one, you've got grid two here, and whatnot. So um, it'll help you out. Um, you got just various pin connections. You got cathode here, which is on pin eight, which is also tied up to a uh, screen pin. But um, gives you a good pin out of it. Then it starts walking you through the. Uh, It'll tell you it's 6.3 volts of heater voltage. It'll tell you how much current this thing needs. So if, if you're trying to build an amplifier that uses four 6L6s in it and you're trying to figure out well, what size uh, circuit would I need to build in the power supply to feed the uh, filaments, well, you could say four of these times 0.9 amps. You know, you're going to need pretty darn close to a, what, 3.6 um, amps of current and you know typical uh, electrical engineer stuff would say hey if it's 3.6 you're going to build at least twice that so you're going to probably build something on up into the five six seven uh amp range to feed uh to feed these things so uh but then it starts talking about all sorts of uh you know inner electrode capacitances between various nodes it'll t this is what i love it'll tell you the maximum ranges so the maximum value a plate voltage you can put on this thing if it's a 6L6 would be 36 360 volts whereas a 6L6 you can design all the way up into the 500 volt range on the plate tells you a typical you know grid uh, screen voltage um, tell you where this things typically operate at um, on down it'll show it for you in a typical class A amplifier where you just have a, a single amplifier amplifying the entire circuit like at the top um, or if you're in a push-pull configuration where you're doing what I was talking about earlier and splitting off the top part of the signal and sending it to one tube and the bottom part to the other. Um, you can run these um, much higher uh, power because uh, the duty cycle is only 50%. It's only acting 50% of the time, whereas this thing will have a duty, much higher 100% duty cycle. But it kind of goes then it shows you typical, um, you know, uh, Tube trace curves um, for the various um, um, configurations and settings with, within this thing. It'll tell you optimal operating voltages or whatnot, and, and on and on. But um, one of the things that I, you know, that's handy in this book here you're after is kind of this value of transconductance. It'll tell you what these tubes should be doing in this signal of micromos. Um, so 6,000, 5,300, or 5,200. Um, should tell you about how much gain this tube should have. So if you're using one of those tube testers that will actually give you actual values of GM um, or that uh, micromo is another word for it. But um, you know, then you could you could tell whether it was a new tube or not by what this thing just told you that uh, that a new tube should be. So having said all that, um, I will tell you that both this tube tester and this tube tester cannot tell you direct GM values. And I don't really care. <laughs> Here's the reason why. I'm really after relative values for myself. I'm not doing scientific studies. Um, and like I said, I bought a $3,000 Ampletrex tube tester that will tell you, tell you exact GM value settings. Um, it never got any use because it's a very slow tube tester is what I found. Uh, it's, it's great. It's accurate. You can get up to your computer. You can run plots and grids all day long uh, of your tubes. really helps with selling high-end tubes worth a lot of money on eBay, but since I only buy and hoard tubes and don't sell any, uh, didn't see the need in that. But at um, any rate, um, what I really care about is how does this tube stack up to the next tube and are they balanced well? And what would a new value be for one of these tubes? So I will tell you that the, the, the meter on this TV7 kind of goes on a scale of 0 to 120 here. And um, where it said in here 5300 was a uh, 6L6 um, GM value that should be there. I can tell you that on this meter it should, it should be around 40. And um, there's a guy named Daniel Nielsen. Um, and there's some other guys, um, I think it's alltubetesters.com or something like that. They will sell a actual meter replacement for this. Uh, this has the original uh, Phasetron meter in it. Um, but if this thing ever died, this meter, I would go to one of those guys and I would buy a replacement meter. 
And what they've done is they've put a GM scale on here instead of the 0 to 120. So another way you can do it, you can you can convert via you know basically spreadsheet or do some math or a, a lookup table if you wanted to. Um, I'm happy knowing that a new 6L6 uh, should test a 40, and mine um, will test one here in a second. We'll see what it tests, and if it tests 40 or more, I know that it's in the good range. Um, you know, from a it tests as good as a new tube. And then if I test two of them and two of them come out at 44 uh, each, then I know these things are fairly well balanced. Um, and so, uh, like I said, you can simply upgrade this thing by replacing the meter in it. Let's get into testing a tube. Um, you will see that um, most of these tube testers come with a book. And if you'll notice, this one was the test data for electron tube sets for the A, A, U, B, and 7D. And this thing is dated January 1962 by the Department of the Army. Um, and when you flip this thing open and get to the and the pages about the tubes. They're basically alphabetically sorted here. So 6JA, 6K, 6L. Ooh, and then I get to the 6L6 right here. Um, and really what this thing, what it's designed to do here is basically tell you how to configure this thing to test a 6L6. So let's talk about a couple things in this practical guide to tube testing. First off, do not put the tube into the tube tester until you have configured it. And let me tell you why. Let's just say, for example, the last tube you tested was a 12AX7. Well, then your filament voltage would probably, if you see right here, filament voltage, would probably be sitting on 12.6 because you tested a 12 volt tube last time, right? And then you would come over here and you would say, well, let's get ready to test this uh, 6L6, which is a 6-volt filament tube. And you would drop this thing in there. And in less than about two seconds flat, you just fried the filament inside of this tube by putting 12 volts on it when it's supposed to get 6 volts. And um, guess what? Um, this tube right here could go in the garbage because when the filament is gone, there is no way to fix that. Let me repeat that. There is no way. There is not like some some sort of way or it's really hard to do or whatnot it is impossible you have to break the vacuum seal you have to open this tube up you have to go inside of it you have to put a new filament inside of the thing you have to pull a new vacuum you have to seal it up um, if somebody had the lab equipment to do that it would probably cost thousands or if not millions of dollars and uh, wouldn't be worth doing it's just not gonna happen so you throw the tube in the garbage if its filament is gone I actually bought, uh, I bought out a lot of tubes from a guy one time, you'll find this funny story. Um, he had a whole trailer load full. Uh, he was an auctioneer and he called me up and he said, hey, I hear through the grapevine uh, here in the country you're a guy that buys up tubes and I've got an auction coming up this week with a bunch of tubes at it and I just you know, want to make sure these things get sold. So if you wouldn't mind coming over and taking a look at this stuff. Um, so I went over and looked at it, and I, was, I said, hey, how about to let me buy it all now and not wait on the auction? And he was fine with that, too. So he sold me the whole uh, trailer full of tubes for a couple hundred bucks. And um, and the, the old guy said, oh, and I got a tube tester that comes with it. And I said, oh, cool. So he, he brought out this old tube tester. And he said, yeah, I was playing around with this tube tester trying to figure it out last night. And I was, you know, here's the tubes I was trying to test, but I couldn't ever get it to work. Could you show me how it works? And he literally handed me a Ziploc bag that had four 45 um, RCA tubes in it that sh you know could be a hundred to two hundred dollar a piece tubes. Um, and I, I looked at them and I and I said, well, let me see the tester. Sorry about that. Anyway, finish the story. So anyway, the guy brings the tube tester out, and the first thing I look over at it, you know, if you know anything about a two forty five tube, it actually runs way over here at this uh, uh, two and a half volt um, setting. And um, and uh, the thing was sitting on 12 volt filament. And I said, how many of those did you try to test? And he said, well, I tried, to, I tried testing all of them, and none of them showed good. So I figured I was doing something wrong. And I said, yeah, you killed all four of those tubes by having the filament voltage sitting on 12 volts and, uh, and turning it on. So um, literally to say, uh, I got a bag full of four dead 45s, which uh, was uh, really saddening. But that, that's my point here is if, if this thing had been sitting on 12.6 and I plugged this thing in there before reading this and configuring, I would just have fried that tube. 
So, let's go read what this 6L6 says, and it'll tell you here at the top. Um, if you can see it, and I don't know how clear this camera is. Let's just go across. So filament, 6.3 volts, right? And then you got the selectors, and it says HS5-3481. You'll see that here in a minute. Then it says bias, set the bias to 23. And it says set the shunt to just a dash, which means no shunt. Put it on range D, press 3 to determine the value, and a minimum value for a good tube is 25. What this book will not tell you is what a new tube test. So if you're trying to rate a tube as to whether it's new old stock, let's say you found a tube, you know, in a box, something like this, and you're like, wow, I wonder if that tube's new or just a pull. Because TV shops were notorious for um um, shotgun approach to troubleshooting. They would literally um, um, pull a tube out, put it in. If that didn't solve the problem, they'd pull that tube back out, put it in the box here. Um, but if it did solve the problem, they may take the dead tube then and put it in this box <laughs> and then send it back uh, in their little bin and and then they forgot whether that one was good or bad or whatnot. And uh, So you just never know. Just because the tube's in the box does not mean it's new. Um, so let's get back over here. So we got the D, we got 325. I can tell you by looking up online, or if I told you earlier, if you wanted to look up the uh, GM value in here, I think it's 5300, and then you want to go do the little conversion between this and that, you would find that right on the 40 line is where a new tube would sit. So, you know, I could make a note in my book here that says 40. I just haven't done so. Um, I will tell you, you can download this book. Um, instead, of, if, you're, if your tube tester is missing one of these, you can download this little book. Um, there's also been some in updates made since this book. Um, and I've got a spreadsheet, basically, I'll show you here in a minute, that has newer values than maybe this book has. Maybe a tube that came out after 1962. Um, it'll tell you how to configure this. But let's get this one out of the way real quick. 6.3 filament. So... We're going to change it from the 12.6 over to 6.3. The reason I'm going to go through the detail I'm going to on this one, if you can learn to use this, you can use any tube tester on this planet. And I'll show you the same settings on this one. And you'll see what I mean. So, um, 6L6, then the settings, HS53481 right here. HS53481, as you can see right there. So what you do is you start here um, with settings, and if you'll notice, um, I've already turned it, but it, let's just say this was over here and this was over here. We'll just get them all mixed up here. Okay, so I would come along then. I've set the filament voltage, which was the first thing. I've then gone here, and I'm going to go H, S, come to here, to the grid setting, 5, 3, 4, 8, 0. Right. Let's look at it one more time. Oop. HS53481. I would have got it wrong. HS53481. There are a lot of other tubes that I test that use HS53480. So I always double check. HS53481. HS53481. One. Okay. Then, what does it say next? Set the bias to 23 on this thing, right? So we come over here next to a setting that says um, bias. And we're going to turn it till we get it on a 23. Dead on, right here. Then it's going to say for this tube, there is no shunt. Shunt, zero. You typically only turn shunt on when you're measuring rectifier or diodes. Um, tubes. And then next, um, let's see, it says 6063481.23, we've got that set. 23, we've got the shunt at zero, range D. Over here, you'll notice we got a range setting that goes A, B, C, D. We're on D. And let's see, then we've got to press 3 and a minimum value of 25. So once you have it all set up here, right, that is time to insert the tube. A couple things, I've already had this thing turned on and the reason being 
this unit inside of it actually has a fairly decent high voltage power supply. It has a couple tubes in there. I think a type 80 or 83 high voltage rectifier um, that basically produces high voltage uh, that it will apply to the plate of these things. So this tube tester needs to warm up a little bit. This tube tester does not. It, uh, it uses a uh, a solid state power supply in this one basically so it doesn't require any warm up time but this one does so I went ahead and turned it on and I've had it on for a little while now if that makes sense to let it warm up I like to leave it on for a good 10 minutes before I start using it or so um, at this point you can see here we've got a 7 pin miniature tube socket we've got a 9 pin socket um, we've got what they call a Loctal tube socket for Loctal tubes um, we've got our 8-pin tube socket. Um, we've got some an acorn style. Um, you know, here we've got a 6-pin, 5-pin, and a 4-pin setup. But we're going to use the uh, the octal setting. And if you'll notice, notice how this thing's raised up right here. Similarly, I've got the same things on both of these. These are called tube savers. Um, and if you notice, I don't have those over here. They just the sockets that came inside of these things are what I've been using. Well, because I use this thing so much, uh, this TV7, I've installed these. You can buy them online. It's basically nothing more than a tube socket that plugs inside of a tube socket. And the purpose of that is so that when you uh, when you use this thing a thousand times, putting tubes in and out of it, in and out of it, in and out of it, and you wear these pins out right here, well, guess what? You did not wear out the original pins in the original tube tester. Then you can throw this tube this tube saver away, put a new one in it, and test, test, test. I will tell you that there's typically a screw down inside of these. You have to open this unit up, put a screw on the other side that holds this um, tube saver in tightly. And you can see similar settings here inside of these. Um, I've seen ones that don't have the screw locking part and you just push them down in there. What you'll find though, a lot of times then, you'll push this tube down into it and you go to pull it out and you pull the safe the uh, socket saver with it so I like the ones that are bolted down really well and if you'll notice here it's an 8 pin octal tube it's got 8 pins not all 8 pins are always present because not all 8 pins are used on these but you'll see the key here um, and if you'll notice this thing has a key here you just turn the tube until you get to the key and then push this thing down a couple things should start happening at this point um, first and foremost this tube here will uh, start to light up on the inside you can see here that is the filament glowing at 6.3 volts. If it had been glowing at 12 volts, guess what? It would be burnt out by now. So uh, always get your configuration right before you plug this thing in. The next thing we're going to do, there's two buttons here, and I can't show you all this with one hand um, at the camera, but I'm going to show you here. There is a knob here titled Line Adjust. And what this is, is basically a, uh, think of it as a small variac um, inside of this thing that adjusts the voltage that coming from the line gets used throughout the tube tester. It's nothing more than a big potentiometer right here. But what you're going to do is use this line adjust potentiometer along with this line adjust button along with this little thing right here where it says line test in the very middle and what we're going to do here is I'm going to push this button and hold it down and hold, see right here where it says line test and it is not in the very middle and here's what I will tell you every time I test a tube I, t I check the line adjust setting let me show you why um, I'm going to adjust this thing until the line's dead on. So I'm going to let loose. I'm going to turn this thing a little bit over here. Normally you would adjust it while holding this down. Um, anyway, we're dead on the line right now. Normally you would just right hand hold this down, use your left hand to adjust this, and get it dead on the line. I just can't do that and hold the camera all at once. But if you'll notice, it's spot on right now. What that means is that the voltage being applied to everything from the input is at the proper voltage to give you the settings you want to uh, measure this tube effectively, right? Um, 
So at that point we've got everything set, the 23, the 0, the HS, 5, 3, 4, 8, 1, we're on range D, we've test tested the line voltage and we're spot on. We're going to hit the button, what did it tell us up here? 6L6, right? Range D, button 3. We're looking for a minimum value of 25. So this button here is what? Your mutual conductance button. We're going to push it and what happens? It starts moving over and we can read that tube tested right at a 41. So, um, remember 40 was new, so this is a new tube and it tested like it should, new. Um, watch how quick this is. Now this thing's configured, you want to test another 6L6? Just grab this tube, pull it out. If you remember, 6L6s came in a wide variety of styles and packages here. Um, get that one in there, right? And I could just come over here now, let the tube warm up got to wait on the filaments to get hot enough for the tube to actually act properly. Um, I could push the mutual conductance button and test it, but watch this. Let's push this line adjustable. It's off just a hair to the left. Um, there we go. Maybe just a little more. There we go. What happens is, when if I was going from this type tube to another tube just like this one to another one just like this one, I may not even check the line adjust. But when I went from this style tube to this style tube, you know, there might be a little difference in the uh, internal makeup of the filaments or whatnot. And it's really the filaments um, inside of these things <coughs> that um, is taking up some voltage that is... Uh, causing the fluctuation in the adjustment here, but any rate, let's hit the button here. Oop, it's not warming up. Let's see what we get out of this thing. Here we go. It's still warming up. This this one was a little touchy. I had to wiggle it to get it to... Uh, and unfortunately, unlike a glass tube where you can see the filament burning, I couldn't tell that the filament wasn't lit up on this one, but I can tell now that it is, and look at this one. What does it test? 40. Two, four, five, forty-five. I'm gonna test even better. Nice strong tube, even though it looked like an old uh, junker tube. Let me grab a couple more six L sixes. We'll test a few more. All right. This is an old uh, Sylvania six L six G in the old um, Coke bottle style tube. These things have really gotten pricey lately, and I'm not sure why. I've I've got hundreds of them, um, but they. Uh, Used to be everybody wanted these style and size, I guess, for the guitar amplifiers. And uh, the last few years, these, uh, I guess, uh, audio guys building amplifiers. But look at this one. Uh, just let's check the line voltage. If you notice, it's a little to the right. A little bit different variation in the... Uh, there we go. And then we test this, and uh, we get uh, 45 again. I will tell you, if the, the line adjust is slightly off, all it ends up doing is giving you a slightly inaccurate reading, but that's a good strong testing tube, and typically the way I label these things, so let me grab a pen here real quick. I use a uh, small black Sharpie, the extra fine point. Let me show you how I label them. All right, using the extra fine Sharpie, what I do is I write on these things basically might be kind of tough to read here, but uh, basically I wrote 45 slash 25. Because if you'll remember up here, the minimum value was a 25. So in other words, 25 being the minimum value. So I kind of do a little uh, 45 over 25 is the way I write it on this. And what that tells me is, hey, this thing tests really good versus the minimum value. Um, let me show you a couple more things. Uh, I've got another 606 here like this. Let's... Uh, Let's put it in and test it. We'll drop it in. Notice the filaments in there lighting up. We'll have to let it warm up for a minute. Let's we'll see how this one tests. You're getting a lot of time here. Um, you can see it starts as I'm starting to test it. It's slowly climbing a little bit as the tube's heating up. Let it get warmer here. I just want you to see how long it actually takes to test a tube. 
uh, a lot of the others I've been cutting in and out in between. Um, but you can see here this thing's testing at about, it's not climbing any higher. This one tested about a 23. So sad news for this tube. So what I would write is 23 over 25. And the reality is it's a weak tube. I'd probably chunk it in a, a bin full of weak tubes that I have, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see, I brought out a couple others. Here's a 6L6GC. Um, I think this is a Sylvania. We'll drop it in. And uh, test it appropriately. Just a minute to do the same warm up. Didn't make you wait a lot of time on that one. At any rate, that one's even better. That one's up there at a 47 um, out of 40. It's a really strong tube, and I'd write the 47. And lastly, a good old uh, tongue saw 5881s. Man, these are the, uh, the good old the good old things. So I'll, I'll test it. All right. So I'm going to show you this tube. If you'll notice on the bottom of this tube right here kind of hard to see but I've got a little black mark on there that I put on the outside of the tube. Um, if you notice this tube come on tube and this tube only tests about a 30 here which is still good um, probably sound great in an amplifier um, but you just need to have it in there if it's in a push pull configuration with another tube that's about the same but the reason I had that little mark on there you can see the pin has been broken off, the key off the bottom of this thing. And you find that on a lot of tubes um, as they get older. But it doesn't mean it's not a good tube. It doesn't mean it can't be used. You just have to figure out where the original key was at and mark it. And uh, when you plug it in, this thing has a notch here for where the key was at. Um, kind of make sure you get it get it right um, when you do that. Let's jump over here and test, um, test one on this tube tester. So show you how to configure it properly. Similarly, look what it has. It has a book. Um, and in the front of the book, it's the tube data for the ICO model 667. Um, I actually have a spreadsheet here attached on the front for some of the more common tube types that I test. Um, keep me from flipping all the way through the book, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, any rate, we're going to find 6L6, right? What's it say here? 6.3 volt watt filament at the top. And then it tells you where to set the grid and where to set the plate. So we're going to come over here and the filament. Filament. 6.3. It's going to tell us where to set the grid. It told us 55 on the grid. It told us on the plate. What did it say? 6L6 plate. Set it to 95. And let's read here, 6L6. Then it says levers, 6143562. What you do is you come along here left to right, going across, and you basically set these levers. 6143, I got that 5, yep, 6143562. Then one 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 all the way across here. You notice one 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 one. Then a four and a one, and so I end up with the last one at four and one. So you're basically just configuring all the settings around the tubes again. And by the way, you would not want to plug your tube in until you've done all of this. Once you've got all that in, then you really only got to worry about three things. Three, four, five, and eight. And you'll see, and if you'll notice, the eight has an underscore on it, and then it'll tell you that's for checking leakage of tubes, and then the merit, the value of the tube, the three. So let's plug. Um, let's go back with this big tube here, so we can get it to light up. Because I think it tested really good and strong earlier. Um, the way these tube testers work, so when you're pushing this mutual conductance button, or in this case on this one, when you're hitting the merit button, what you're actually doing is applying 
the plate voltage. Um, prior to that, all these settings and configurations basically light up the filament and other parts of the tubes, but it's when you're pulling the lever that you're actually applying the plate voltage to the tube. If you'll notice one of the things we will do next here, line, right? So what does that button do? Well, if you hold it down, if you'll notice here, there's a little thing here in the middle that says line adjust. So we're to the right a little bit. I need to move it over to the left. And there's that line adjust. Okay, a little more to the left. And a little more back to the right. Normally I'd have you can do all this at once. Okay. Okay. Then if you'll remember this thing said three, four, five, eight. So you hit the button here. Three. You hit the button here. Four. And if you'll notice there's nothing moving here. It's looking for leakage. It's checking um, for leakage between um, pins on the tube. So three, four, five, no leakage. When you hit this eight button, if you remember, it had an underscore on it. The thing pegs out over here. You have to hit this HK leak, and it should take it all the way back over. So in other words, it goes when you hit the eight button. It pegs out. You hit the eight button. It takes it all the way back over. If it doesn't go all the way back over, then um, then you've got some leakage within the tube. So we did the. Three, four, five, eight. Didn't see any leakage there. And now we're ready to put it back on three and pull the little merit lever here. And when I pull this lever down, look, we're getting a reading of about 122 or so, which is a really good strong tube. And this one also has a, vi a kind of a guide at the top that gives you relative. Um, you know, it's, let's say you had one test here in the yellow. You might want to go look up. Um, a little more about that tube. It might be a tube that doesn't test very high, so it could still be a very good tube even though it tests yellow. So this is just a, uh, a relative value scale here. And let's move on. Let me unplug this tube here. Let's move back to one more tube we're going to test. Um, I wanted to show you how to test a, uh, the two sides of a 12AX7 here. Okay, a couple things here. First off, when you get to the 12AX7, you got to be real careful here in this book because there's 12AX7, 12AY7, 12AZ7. They all look about the same, 12AV7. If you'll notice when you get to the 12AX7 right here, you have more than one of them, 12AX7 and 12AX7. There's, there's two of them. It's same with 12AY7, 12AY7, 12AZ7, 12AZ7. Why are there two settings? Because there's two tubes inside of this one. So that what you got to do is you got to do the first one, EV7 6080, right? So 12.6 volts. Already done that up here. E, right? V7. Oops, seven six zero eight zero. EV7 6080, as it says. Bias at a 12. Got the bias at a 12. Got the shine at a zero. Yeah, I'm on range B. Range B. And I've done the line adjust again. Spot on. I've let this tube heat up. And guess what? We're testing at a 30. But if you'll come over here and look, 12AX7, 6080. Minimum value, 32 for triode number one. There's two parts to this tube. There's also triode number two. So this thing tested a 30 out of a... Uh, out of a 32, which means it is weak. Um, that's a sad thing too, because that is a uh, Mullard um, 10M tube that I found here recently while digging through some stuff. Um, but here's the gotcha. Now you got to you've only tested one half the tube. You got to test the other half of it. I always pull the tube for doing that. Why? Because you're going to be changing configurations to get to the second half of that tube. I don't want to be changing configurations with the tube in there. But if you'll notice, we're going to go 12AX7 instead of that EV76080, it's EV21030, EV2, alright, EV21030, one, 
zero, three, zero. Then the rest of it should be the same, 12B. Okay. Plug the tube right back in. Nice gold pin tube. It's kind of a bummer. And we got to let it warm up just a little bit here. And we've let it warm up. And we're testing it, and it tested about a 27. So um, let me tell you how I would write that down. All right, I wrote it on the tube, but it's really small, so I doubt you could see it. So I wrote it over here. But that's the way I denote that. I'll write 30 slash 27 over 32. So let me just tell you, um, that's not that unbalanced. It's I'd like to see it closer. I'd like to see it be like 30, 29 or 30, 28, but it's not way off. And I'll also tell you that a tube that tests 30-ish out of 32 isn't, it isn't a bad tube. In other words, it's just not in a, uh, in a great range. This thing may still sound great in an amplifier. Um, although I'd rather have it balanced a little more than that. It's starting to get a little bit of uh, separation there. So probably wouldn't use it based on that. But if this thing had been uh, 30, 30 over 32, I'd probably keep that in my good box for use later. But hopefully I've given you a good idea of you know what, what goes on. Oh yeah, the thing I was going to tell you. Let's say you're testing a great example. Um, my son and I tested these yesterday. These are uh, old RCA 6080 tubes, um, which, by the way, are used these days in some uh, high-end headphone amplifiers. I know Bottlehead and some others like to use these. Um, but I've got literally hundreds of these, and I don't I don't need any more. So when I find a bunch of them, um, kind of the deal I've got going with uh, my sons, or I've got two young boys, and I've got a teenage daughter as well. Um, but my boys have kind of picked up an interest in some of this. Um, I basically give them the tubes I don't want, and they test them, um, and they bag them up. They, you probably find this lot on eBay right now, um, the tubes that uh, my son put up there. And um, uh, it gives them some college money, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, but these tubes have two tubes inside of every one of them. This was my point in showing you this. And, uh, there's probably 20 tubes there in that bag. The way we did it was we set them up, did the settings for one side, and we tested all 20 tubes on one side. And then we took all 20 tubes aside down here, labeled them, and then we put in the, um, uh, changed all the configuration settings to the second half of the tube. Then we went back through and checked all 20 tubes again using the second set of settings. Um, it's just easier that way. It's easier than swapping back and forth, back and forth between every tube. Um, testing both sides of the tube, then testing uh, you know, the next tube and both sides. You know. It's easier just to do all of one side and then all of another as you're going through them. I'm going to go sit down at the desk now for the rest of this session and just talk to you about a few more tips and pointers. Oh yeah, by the way, this was something unique I found recently. It's a uh, tube tapper. <laughs> it's a little pencil-like device with erasers on the two ends of it here. And it was literally designed in a circuit, basically, for a TV repairman to be able to go in there and tap on a tube real gently and see if the tube was microphonic. Um, so Because you could have a scenario where... Uh, and the tube just acted up when it when it moved or when the filaments got shook or whatnot. Uh, so somebody walking through the house, hey, my audio sounds distorted, but when everybody's still in the house, it's not. You could have a tube that's uh, a little bit microphonic and uh, needs replacing because it doesn't deal well with vibrations or movement or whatnot. And uh, I guess that's what this little thing was designed to do. But I've been collecting tubes for many, many, many years, and that's just not something I've... Uh, I've seen before, so I thought it was pretty neat. All right, before I go over there, I just wanted to show you a couple of things. You know me, I'm notorious for remembering stuff and wanting to add it. On this uh, tube tester, I always pull all the levers down before I store it. The cord here wraps up, goes into the top. Um, the lid on this thing comes down nicely and uh, snaps up. Similarly on this one, this thing's got a nice little uh, space here to wrap the cord around, plug it in. Um, it also has some uh, tube socket, uh, some tube uh, pin straighteners here. So it's one of the cool things about this TV7. This thing here is designed to uh, 
kind of straighten pins. If you had the pins a little bit bent on this thing, you put them down in here and wiggle it a little bit, it'll uh, straighten your pins. The other thing it has here is the, uh, the connection that you would... Uh, I'm just going to get this thing out of here. Sorry, a little tough to get that out, but I took the little thing out. And what it is here is it's a, uh, it's a wire that plugs in here for plate. Um, it comes up here, and this thing has an external connection on it on the top of this tube for the plate connection. I must warn you, that can be anywhere from 300 to 600 volts, depending on the settings here. So when you push that mutual transconductance button down and you're testing a tube type that has an external plate, just keep your fingers away from that. And don't do it when kids are around. You would basically push the button, it would apply a high voltage to the plate right there. Um, you would get a reading off of this tube. All these other tubes that I tested, um, you know, like that uh, 606 and whatnot, the plate connection wasn't on the top of the tube like this. It was uh, you know, down inside of one of the pins. But certain tube types, especially these compactrons and others, that operate at such high voltages, um, there's just inner pin um, space concerns down here in the bottom of these things. So they actually lifted the plates off the top of the tube uh, because there's such high voltage going to these. Um, you could be dealing with uh, you know, plate voltages in the thousands of volts on some types of tubes. Um, these, these typically operate in the uh, 450 to 600 volt range. But, and if you'll notice when the cord's all done up here, we can close the lid on this thing properly. We can uh, come up here and lock it down. This thing has a nice water. Um, rubber seal in it, weather, waterproof, weatherproof, beautiful tube tester. And if you'll notice now down underneath my workbench, um, right down here is where they stay on this little sh wooden shelf here. Um, right handy dandy, ready to be picked up, ready to throw up here, ready to use. I've had uh, Hickok 539, B's, C's, um, other big tube testers. They do a great job. Um, really big, fancy tube testers take up half this bench. Um, not nearly as portable or easy to use, in my opinion, as these two things. So it's why these are my favorites. Uh, not to say those other tube testers aren't good. I'm just telling you why these are my favorites. Remember earlier we talked about really good tube testers, is okay tube testers, not so great tube testers. Well, this is the bottom end of that spectrum. This is like an old Lafayette. I picked this up at uh, Hamfest, I think, for $10 or something like that. Um, I'm a ham radio operator. Uh, Kilo Golf 4, Foxtrot Delta Romeo. Um, and I, um, you know, I get a lot of events based around ham radio stuff. Some of those guys there are dealing old tube stuff. You don't find much audio stuff there, but... You do find a lot of electronics and tube stuff. Um, anyway, this was one I picked up for just a few dollars. It's got a little book inside of here, and you can go through and configure the settings similarly. But I can tell you that all this thing is good for basically is does this tube good because it doesn't do emissions testing. Um, and I, I was reading up on the schematic for this thing. This thing actually tests your tubes at around 40 volts on the plate. Well, that's not real-life circuit scenario. This thing's not applying real-life uh, voltages to the, to the tubes. So uh, this thing could tell you a tube's really good when it's, you know, it would perform marginally or whatnot. So it's a small little thing. As you can see, uh, you know, an ink pen here beside of it. It's not much bigger. Um, it might be okay to, as a portable thing to carry around just to see if a tube's good or not, but I tend to stay away from some of these lower end ones uh, like this. Uh, Knight made a lot of kits, tube tester kits that are similar scenario. Um, I don't know, that ICO to me is kind of the entry level into getting into a good tube tester. Let me show you some more here on, uh, on eBay real quick. I just did a search for Hickok tube tester. And I did a, uh, you know, a previously sold, um, you know, up here on the uh, sold listings, I clicked uh, previously sold. But um, you'll see here, like, there's a, uh, you know, an 800K here, went for $250. You got a uh, another one for 205 You've got a 605 here that went for $134. 
you know, a six thousand that went for three ninety nine. Um, and you got there's a five thirty nine B for uh, that one's uh, looked like it ended at three hundred sixty some dollars. Um, you know, it's different tube testers out here, but you can get something decent in the three hundred dollar range, like that eight hundred A, that six thousand A would be a good one. You just got to pay attention to what tube sockets does it have. It may not have the older four pin. Or it may not have the compactrons you're looking for, or make sure it's at least got a 9-pin and an octal. Um, the 9-pin and the octal are the two that every tube tester better have, or you do not want it. Um, let me click up here. I also searched for uh, TV7 tube testers, as you can see. Some of these are nice DU like that. This one looks like it went close to $1,200 some dollars. There's a plain 7U for $550. Interestingly, there's a 7DU for 450. What you got to watch out for though is has it been calibrated? Does everything work? Um, so if you're buying one online, you might want to might want to buy one that's being advertised, um, you know, as being calibrated or cleaned or whatnot. Um, like you notice this one here sold for 900 some dollars. Dan Nilsson, he's kind of the the king of TV sevens. He's actually who I learned my stuff from. Um, it was odd because I uh, I contacted him years ago and said, hey, I want you to uh, calibrate a tube tester for me, but I don't want to send it to you. I basically want you to walk me through your process. Um, <laughs> because there's the old military way, there's manuals, but to do it the way that the TV7 military manual tells you to do it, you have to have about three other pieces of military test equipment very specific test equipment that I didn't really want to go buy and I figured this guy wasn't using that stuff so I was trying to get him to uh, teach me the, the tricks of the trade and he was willing to do so I paid him basically the same price as if I would have sent it to him but he just basically via email and phone and whatnot walked me through it so this is a top-notch stellar guy this Dan Nelson you can google him and find him uh, you won't go wrong going there um, it's not magic to calibrating a tube tester, but it can be a little tedious and it can take some work if that makes sense. Another website with a lot of good info on tube testers is alltubetesters.com. Seem to be reputable guys. I've ordered some parts from them before. They sell different things. Um, one of the things they sell are replacement meters. So like if your ICO 667 meter goes out, you can actually come here and buy one. You'll notice they sell one here for the TV7DU. Um, and if you click on it, it'll show you what their new meter looks like. This is what I found interesting. A while back, I was repairing a TV7 for a guy, and I was calibrating it, and he wanted me to put one of these new TV7DU GM improved scale meters, which was basically uh, what I told you about. Um, showed the uh, mutual transconductance or GM value. Um, and I notice it's interesting that they've taken this picture off of uh, offline here. <laughs> uh, this picture I think was online at one time, but people may have been copying it or whatnot. So I dug back through my pictures and uh, lo and behold, here's one I found in my archives um, of me testing a tube on a TV7DU tube tester, as you can see. Slightly different than the, uh, the one I had, but check out the meter here if I can get it to focus nice and clear here um, let me zoom this thing in a little bit there you go you can see it um, it basically tells you you know if you're on the uh, D setting you know a value of uh, 20 would be 2500 um, GM a value of 40 would be 5000 remember earlier we talked about the 6L6 being around that five or fifty-two hundred at the forty, but basically uh, they just adjusted the scale here to actually uh, to include the GM values below it. Um, and if you'll notice, this scene's got it uh, all tubetesters.com right here. He is uh, he's kind of you know labeled his thing here uh, appropriately and trademarked it. And uh, guy sells these things. I you know I think it was two hundred twenty-five dollars for that meter. Um, but I would highly recommend one if you wanted to know the actual GM values. Or you could, uh, <laughs> I could take a picture of this, stick it on the wall, and uh, when I'm testing one, I could just refer to it, basically. At any rate, um, you know, I was just talking a little bit about various tube testers. Uh, like I said, those Hickox, the 6000A, 
600, the 6000, 6000A, the 800A, the 752, 539B, and C all are great tube testers. There's one called the Signal Corps I-77B. It's a great tube tester for testing older tubes like 45, 283, 300, or whatnot. Basically operates identically to the uh, to the TV7. The only downside to it, it doesn't have a nine-pin tube socket. It doesn't test the little 12IX7s. Um, you know, Syncor, B and K, Jackson makes a great tube tester. There's good stuff out there. Do your research. I'm just showing you what I use and what I think is easy and uh, um, easy to use, and whatnot. I showed you a little bit about what I said relative versus actual GM. I don't need this, to be honest. Um, I just care that this one tested 42 and the one beside of it I'm testing is at 42. I know those two tubes are matched at that point in time. Um, yeah, if you got any questions, just uh, reply to this email or this video with a uh, post out there and I'll respond to you either directly to the post or send you an email or whatnot. But hopefully you've learned a little something today. This was my practical guide to tube testers, everybody. Um, I'm going to close this one up. Um, I've had some health issues over the last week or so, and so I've been down for the count. I haven't really felt like working on any gear. So that's why I've uh, uh, elected to do this uh, tube tester video without uh, having to lift a lot of heavy gear and work on it or whatnot. So stay tuned and more coming soon. Thanks, everybody.